Once there was a war, a war like none other ever before. A war cloaked in darkness, lit only by the flash of flares and searchlights, the explosions of bombs and the blaze of burning planes. For the first time in the history of human conflict, a war was fought between men and machines in the air at night. It became a struggle of science and technology and newer and more deadly discoveries. As the night war reached its culmination, the air crews fought a desperate and lonely battle against each other's tactics and weapons. By 1943, the men of Bomber Command were about to face their sternest test. Berlin, the most heavily defended piece of land in the world. In the beginning, a bombing operation was very, very simple. The orders would come down to send crews to Mannheim or whatever. They'd find a route and they'd fly to Mannheim. That's if they could find Mannheim at all. Well, navigation at that time was very basic. The only aids that you had were radio bearings. And um, once you were halfway across the English Channel, uh, you had no confidence in them, really. The Germans had developed a defensive system called Himmelbett. It was based on the coordination of searchlights, anti-aircraft guns, and night fighters directed from the ground. It was very successful. Luftwaffe historian Gebhard Eders noted that in 1942, Bomber Command had increased its raids threefold, but the Luftwaffe had multiplied its number of kills by 15. The answer of the Royal Air Force on the increasing shots of the Dutch night yacht was the bomber stream, which was the first time by the 1000 bomber attack auf Köln am 31. Mai 1942 durchgeführt wurde. The bomber stream was designed to overwhelm the German defensive system by putting as many bombers through one sector in as short a period of time as possible. Instead of bombers coming separately, they punched through the German defenses like water through a burst dam. Siehe da, das System, das Marshal Harris aufgebaut hatte, Funktionierte. Es wurden erstaunlich wenig Flugzeuge abgeschossen, obwohl sie immer wieder ein Himmelbettraum durchflogen. Aber sie stießen nur auf drei, vier, fünf, sechs Jäger. Und dann war man durch diese Zone durch. Und man flog relativ gefahrlos. The Bomber Stream was a resounding tactical success. The growing Allied industrial power also began to play a significant role. The large four-engined bombers like the Halifax and the Lancaster were beginning to be issued to the RCAF's number six group, which had been established as part of Bomber Command in the north of England. Both the British and the Germans knew that they could create an electronic storm of false radar signals by dropping a mass of small strips of tinfoil. But both delayed using this for fear of revealing the secret to the other side. The metal foil was called window. Window was first used over Hamburg. The German defenses were obliterated and the city destroyed. British scientists had also developed new navigational aids that are still used today, like G and Oboe, in order to locate the targets over the blacked-out continent. They both used directional radio beams, and radio beams can be bent or jammed. So the British developed an onboard radar device called H2S. Oh, it was marvelous, marvelous. Most of us were carrying the H2S scanner. It gave you a picture of the ground almost like a topographical map. The built-up area, the water, the trees, the roads, everything all showed up in, in various shades of black and whites and grays. It was just like a picture uh, of what you were flying over. 
Every electronic signal has its own Achilles heel. All radio and radar emissions can be tracked back to reveal their sender's location. Unfortunately, we couldn't use it uh, as a main bomber force that often because uh, the little signals that were being sent out to mark the ground in the details could be picked up by enemy forces and they could home in on your aircraft on those little signals. This system was called Naxos by the Germans who had even more deadly equipment on their night fighters like the Messerschmitt 110. These antlers are the receivers for an airborne radar called Liechtenstein. It could track an allied bomber from a distance of a mile. As it was radar, it could be jammed if only the Allies could discover its wavelength. In late 1942, pilot officer Paulton of the RCAF and his crew flew their Wellington bomber on a suicide mission. It flew alone and seemed to be asking for an attack from the German night fighters. It was shot at 12 times and seriously damaged. This Wellington was not an ordinary bomber. It was packed with secret electronic equipment which measured the wavelength of the night fighter's radar. The badly wounded radio operator was able to transmit this invaluable data to England before the Wellington ditched in the sea off the coast. Miraculously, all the crew survived. Armed with this information, Bomber Command could not only jam Liechtenstein, but also turn it against its users. A passive homing device called Serati was developed by the scientists. It could home in to the Liechtenstein signals from as far away as 80 kilometers. For both sides, the night air war was entering its most dangerous phase. Six Group and Bomber Command were about to undergo a trial by fire in one of the most deadly battles of the war over Berlin, the big city. The Battle of Berlin began in November 1943. Sir Arthur Harris believed that if he could flatten Berlin or do enough damage in Berlin to destroy the morale of the civilian population of the German capital, or perhaps destroy the morale of at least some of the government circles, he might be able to win the war without requiring massive land battles on the part of the Allied armies. The Battle of Berlin continued until March of 1944. Air Marshal Harris said, we can wreck Berlin from end to end if the US Army Air Force will come in on it. It will cost us four to 500 aircraft. It will cost Germany the war. The air battle would utilize virtually every tactic, technical innovation, and strategy Bomber Command had in its arsenal. A war in the air is subject to many variables, from the weather to new enemy tactics and weapons. Before each raid, all the air crew would assemble for a briefing. It could make the difference as to whether or not they returned from their operation. We all came together in a big room, crew after crew, all on tables. They would take the cover from the big map on the wall and you would see lines, zigzag lines, red lines of tape going into a target. But right, climb on track, out here to position A. Texel. You know Texel will be some heavy black there, but it shouldn't worry you if you're wide awake. Now from A down to B is no trouble, quite straight forward, but make sure that you are south of Bremen and that you are north of Hanover. When you're clear of Hanover, you've got a clear run through to Berlin. But we then will paid attention, pardon the term, but we really paid attention to what they were being told by the meteorological people, the people from navigation, and the people from uh, logistics and so on, and in particular the armament people, the kind of bomb low we were to carry and so on. The night raid of January 28th, 29th, 1944 involved almost every type of strategic bomber in the RAF and RCAF inventory. Sterlings, Halifaxes, Lancasters, and Mosquitoes all had significant roles. It was, in fact, one of these complexly organized operations that showed just how sophisticated bombing had, been co had become by early 1944. 
The weather forecast was for complete cloud cover over most of Germany and Berlin. The main force route was over the North Sea across Denmark and then south to Berlin. It avoided the heaviest concentration of anti-aircraft artillery. Along the way, there would be red flares dropped to mark the route and aid navigation. The men of 6 Group flew over hostile territory every night. The constant danger cemented a bond among the crews that lingers to this day. Well, on the ground, they used to think we were a wild bunch. But in the air, we settled down. It was our lives at stake. Each, each member of the crew we had knew their job and knew their job well. They had to, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. Your life depended on them, how they did their job, and their life depended on how you did your job, basically. So it was one com totally cohesive unit, you know, if it was a good crew, and most people thought they had a good crew and had the best crew. The air crews were not naive. They knew the losses that they were suffering before they took off for an operation. They had seen their friends shot out of the sky. You didn't think about those things. You concentrated completely on uh, preparation and, and uh, the job that the various crew members had to do. I was frightened, but you did your job. You really did settle down once you took off. Uh, you were very nervous. Or we had a, a lot of us had idiosyncrasies and ritual we'd go through before we took off. But uh, once you off, got off the ground, you, you basically buried your fear, I guess. Preparing for an operation, everyone had his own routine to keep. Flying thousands of miles over enemy country can make even a cynic superstitious. You try to avoid any changes in the routine, such as if somebody in the crew took sick and you had to put in a replacement, you hated to fly with that replacement in your airplane because it broke, if you wish, the spell. We had personal little things. My battle scarf is one of them. I guess everybody had their nervous pee before they climbed into the airplane. That was usually somewhere around the airplane. On the night of January 28th, the complex plan of the 13th raid of the Battle of Berlin began with a few mosquitoes dropping bombs on the city in the early evening. It was a fake or spoof attack. Berlin was on guard. It had been bombed the night before. I think the idea was that with these mosquitoes flying to Berlin and back early in the evening, relatively speaking, the Germans would be convinced that Bomber Command was going to fly someplace else that night. In fact, the real target was Berlin. The first Mosquitoes had returned to base before the main attacking group of 700 aircraft took off. There were several other raids to disguise the main objective. We also did spoof raids uh, with other aircraft that you'd go into another target to try and make the Germans uh, feel that that was the main target for the night and sh uh, shift their night fighters over there accordingly. And uh, you'd drop uh, a certain type of window too, which to the, their radar would appear that there are a lot of aircraft coming in, whereas there might only be eight or something like that. 16 Wellingtons scattered leaflets over northern France. 67 Sterlings dropped mines in Kiel Harbor. The main force would follow in their tracks. As well as this mine laying group in Kiel, there was a diversionary attack on Hanover. 
and mosquitoes of number 100 group, the intruders, were sent to the German night fighter beacons that were likely to be in operation that night because of where Bomber Command was flying and because of where the diversions were flying. The main role of the night intruders was to attack the German night fighters at their own airfields. The plane the intruders used was the best the Allies had, the Mosquito. Build instead an airplane just big enough for a crew of two, four 250-pound bombs, fuel for 1,500 miles, and it would certainly be 100 miles an hour faster, as fast as a fighter. Up until the Hawker Tempest came along and the jets at the end of the war, it was the fastest sort of fighter of the war. Uh, not even the Americans had anything any faster. At altitude, the Mosquito could do 400 miles an hour. The Mosquito was fast, maneuverable, and had good range. Made of wood and powered by 1,700 horsepower Merlin engines, it could reach 39,000 feet, as high as a 747 flies today. It was almost invulnerable. One squadron flew over 5,000 sorties and only lost 18 Mosquitoes. We had four 20 millimeter cannons under the floor of the aircraft and four 303 machine guns in the nose. So in effect, we had eight guns firing forward. So that was quite uh, incredible firepower. During the night intruder operations, the mosquitoes would fly deep into the heart of Germany, hunting the hunters. We circled around the airfields, uh, staying a mile or two away, in the hopes that we, they might use navigation lights or we could pick up their exhaust to catch them before they climbed up into the bomber stream. We actually had more success when the night fighters came back after they'd been attacking the bombers and uh, we caught them in the circuit. I was landing in Munich, Schleisheim, and they told us, mosquitoes in vicinity, mosquitoes in vicinity. I said, well, you go, I had to land. I had to land because I was short of fuel. The red lamps were on. I was to go as low as possible. I knew every hatch there, I knew the pay, no lights, gear down, landing, and at the moment, I was landing. I saw this fellow shooting on me. Thanks God, the tracers were only about 10 meters away. And uh, I made a stop turn. I said, get out, get out, get out. And we went out. And uh, this fellow was strafing us. And uh, he got several uh, night fires that night. As soon as we fired our cannons at this aircraft, there was literally a wall of anti-aircraft fire in front of us and we had to do a very tight turn to stay over the airfield and away from the anti-aircraft defenses on the, on the far side of the airfield. The thing uppermost in your mind was to get the hell out of there as fast as you could. sites, one of the beacons that they decided to orbit was a German night fighter field at Leeuwarden in Holland. But all told, there were over 700 aircraft uh, flying towards Berlin and another 150 to 200 flying diversionary missions. The German defenses with their Würzburg radars and searchlight belts were still very much in place. The route over Denmark was designed to avoid the heaviest concentrations of anti-aircraft guns and searchlights in western Germany and the night fighter bases in Holland, but they still had to fly through the gauntlet to Berlin. The Allied bombing offensive was now pummeling German cities and towns with larger and heavier raids. The Germans realized they couldn't stop the bombing, so they made attempts to disguise the targets. The Germans understood then that they could mislead the British as to where they were attacking, 
by setting up decoy targets. To an air crew coming in for a bombing run at 15,000 feet, one burning city looked very much like another. They would set fires that would draw the bombers away from the actual target to a very intensely burning fire that may have been only 10 miles away from the real target. The Germans went to extraordinary lengths to mislead the Allied bombers. If the, the bomber command flare for the night was green, the Germans realized that if they could set green flares off in the distance, they might be able to distract some of the bomber command crews, some of the crews, uh, from the real target. But the problem was that although they had always had the lead in chemical industries, the dye stuff industries, they were never really able to replicate all of the British colors accurately. The bombers could be decoyed, but wherever they flew, they were going to have to face the guns of the most heavily defended place on the earth, Berlin. The final Berlin defenses were the thousands of anti-aircraft guns. Every air crew's worst fear was to be caught in the searchlights and coned. Well, it was uh, uh, brilliant light, not unlike this. You really couldn't uh, see any distance. You could only see uh, close up and looking at the map or the pilot looking, concentrating on his instruments, that sort of thing. But the inside of the aircraft was uh, brilliantly lit up. The minute they cone you in searchlights, uh, then somebody starts shooting at you. Uh, you see the uh, anti-aircraft coming up, the tracer. Particularly if you're fairly low down, uh, some of the small arms fire is after you as well as the heavy anti-aircraft guns. The master beam would find you, and you could be sure that instantaneously, maybe a few seconds after the, ma the master beam hit you, the satellite searchlights, and all of a sudden you'd maybe have, I don't know, four or five, maybe even more searchlights, all of a sudden, wham, you've, you've got searchlights on you from all over. And it just was like bright daylight in the inside the aircraft. The searchlights stripped the bombers of their best defense, the darkness, and they brought on the greatest danger, the night fighters. When you got cone like that, you knew there's German night fighters going to come if they could get there in time, if they weren't that close to you. The night fighters invariably attacked from the rear. The man in the rear turret had the responsibility for the crew's lives. Your main concern was scanning that sky, because who's next? It could be you. So you did not dare lose your vigil. You've probably seen the turret of the Lancaster, and you've seen that plexiglass that's built into it. All of that plexiglass was taken out. If it was not taken out, we would take it out ourselves, the gunners, because it could obstruct your vision. So we sat out basically in the open. And it was dreadfully cold. Uh, 60 below zero was not at all uncommon. That's 60 below Fahrenheit. With luck and good night vision, maybe you could spot the night fighter before he could attack you. When you sat in the back of that aircraft and you saw an enemy aircraft, it was an immediate starboard go or port go. The bomber's best defense was violent evasive action, the corkscrew. It's a case of getting the command from your tail gunner, and you would drop everything, or the people would drop everything, and you would forget what you're doing. You immediately dove to port. You banked, you dove to port. And then you had to tell them what you were doing, because you go that way so far, and then you had to change and continue your dive to starboard. One thing you had to be careful of with violent evasive action or corkscrews was the attitude of the aircraft if you're in clouds particularly or if you got into clouds you really had to follow your instruments be very careful with the aircraft you couldn't lose it you didn't want to lose it we had on the Lancaster a 102 foot wingspan whereas the enemy aircraft was about a 30 foot wingspan and an aircraft does not do a 90 degree turn in the air 
no aircraft does. It skids across the sky. And with the 30-foot wingspan, he skid much further than we did. By the time he would recover his aircraft, uh, we were down in the trough and coming up the other side. On the night of January 28, a typical bomber was taking off for its second Berlin operation. It was one of 12 Halifaxes that 434 Squadron sent off that night from Croft Aerodrome in North Yorkshire. It was a Halifax Mark V, serial number LK740, call sign V for Victor. Six hundred and eighty-three bombers would carry out the main attack. The bombing run was to begin at 3.13 a.m. and last for 20 minutes. There would be five waves of aircraft. V for Victor was part of the third wave. The main force itself was divided in essentially two parts. And on all such raids where Halifax 2s and 5s were flying, they got the lousy end of the stick because they were flying low. What was done to protect them was to generally put them in the, the second half of the raid so that they wouldn't bear the full brunt of the initial night fighters sent into the bomber stream. The idea was that the initial set of fighters sent into the stream would run out of gas and have to refuel while the second half of the raid was over the target. At least that was the plan. There was broken cloud over the North Sea and severe icing in the clouds over Denmark. Over the Dutch coast, too much cloud to see where. The outside temperature was minus 40 degrees. The thin-skinned aircraft from 434 Squadron joined the bomber stream at 2 a.m., 60 miles west of Denmark. They flew on an easterly course until they turned south at 2.30 they would fly 1,400 miles there and back. There were red route markers dropped over the Danish coast and northern Germany. Wise air crews did not fly near the route markers because the night fighters could see them as well. The German fighters were in the air awaiting orders. The first instructions directing them towards the bomber stream were plotted at 1 a.m. when V for Victor was 200 miles from the Danish coast. The first attacks came near the concentration point and over Denmark. Five attacks were reported by JU-88s. They actually didn't do a very good job of inserting all that number of night fighters into the bomber stream before arrived over the target. It took the German ground controllers almost two hours to realize that the target was Berlin and order the fighters to fly there. They were hampered by the whole range of Bomber Command's electronic defenses. The radar was jammed by window, dropped at the rate of one bundle a minute for most of the route. The German ground controllers running commentary directing the night fighters was jammed immediately. The Germans changed channels, but they too were jammed. They sent signals on the civilian radio, and those were jammed as well. But the electronic war was not all one-sided. Also added to uh, the repertoire of Bomber Command defensive measures was the addition of aircraft warning radar to Bomber Command uh, uh, aircraft. The first of these was Monica. Monica was tail-mounted radar that sent out a signal to warn of an approaching unseen night fighter. The problem was that the Germans eventually discovered Monica in a shot-down bomber 
understood what it was, were able to deduce the frequencies that it was uh, operating on, and they produced a, a number of devices, the first of which was called Flensburg, which when installed in a night fighter, allowed the night fighter pilot to home in on the night fighter warning radars being carried in Bomber Command bombers, so that what had begun to be used as a protective device to protect Bomber Command crews actually ended up setting them up for attack. While comparatively few night fighters penetrated the bomber stream en route, still 12 bombers were shot down before the target was reached. One was V for Victor, which was attacked by a night fighter 30 miles north of Berlin at 3 in the morning. It was seen circling in flames before it crashed. It had been equipped with Monica. All the crew were lost. Berlin was covered by cloud with some visibility through the brakes. The pathfinders began to mark the target with red target indicator flares. Target markers, brilliant colors of reds and greens and yellows that would mark the target and then when the target was marked, you would have backers up that would back the markers up and put more of that color down. They, there was always a, a tendency to uh, drop short of the target. And I used to say uh, on these occasions, only the North Sea stopped Norwich being bombed. Bombers carried a load of two 1,000-pound high-explosive bombs and ten canisters of incendiaries. The explosives would break down the walls and roof, and the fires would destroy the building. Each load was enough to destroy a city block. After dropping their bombs, the crews had to fight their way home. We had been to Berlin and were on our way back when we got cold. We got a direct blast and uh, my engineer was killed. He had a piece about the size of a dime right through his heart. I got hit in the head and I carried a souvenir still of a piece of flak. Bob Pratt corkscrewed to get away from the searchlights and the flak but his Halifax was badly shot up. We lost one motor, and the other one was kind of windmilling, so it basically was down to two and a half engines. Well, at the time, you think, well, what do we do? Do we bail out, or do we head for Sweden, or do we try and get home? So we said, let's take Bert home. That was who was the engineer. And of course, I wanted to get home and get married. So we, we headed home instead of turning off to go to Sweden. Almost 2,000 tons of bombs were dropped. Large fires and prolonged explosions could be seen from beyond the Baltic coast. Coast oh, good work. Nothing to worry about now. 
The attack was considered to be a success. The aircraft returned to base at 8.25 a.m. Bomber Command lost 44 aircraft. 434 Squadron lost five of the 12 aircraft it sent out. After this raid, the older Halifaxes 2 and 5 were withdrawn from the battle. The Berlin authorities reported that 90 Berliners had been killed in the raid and 292 wounded. Bomber Command lost 254 dead and 67 prisoners of war. I, I remember the aircraft going down, of course. Um, one aircraft left us one night all in flames and it drifted for ever so long and it just kept going and going and going. And whenever it did see it hit the ground, I think it burned itself out to a shell on the way down. And I watched that from in front of us till, uh, till it was way behind us. I remember one time I saw this aircraft hit by a lone flak shell, a Halifax bomber. It exploded, and the um, I saw the members of the crew, not all of them, but four of them, just spilling out into the sky, no parachutes on. The Battle of Berlin began in November 1943. It continued until March 1944. There were 19 major raids. Over 10,000 Berliners died, and 423 aircraft of the RAF and the RCAF were lost, with over 2,500 men. Berlin was the deadliest battle that Bomber Command fought. The technical advantages in the industrial might of the Allies shifted the momentum of the war in their favor. Then right after the invasion of Normandy, Germany unleashed one of the most technically advanced weapons of the war. I was going out on an intruder trip and I saw this, what I thought was a burning aircraft coming across the channel and entering the English coast. And I actually called the sector controller and said I saw a burning aircraft coming into England at high speed and uh, that he should know about it. And he said that what you've just seen is one of Hitler's new weapons, the V-1 flying bomb. It was powered by a pulse jet engine that trailed a flame about 20 feet long. And it had a, about a 1,500 pound warhead. And they fired these things from ramps in France, and we could see them being fired, but we had to patrol at 10,000 feet and dive on them to get enough uh, extra speed to shoot them down. And we had to do this before they reached the English coast because there was a big anti-aircraft barrage along the English coast. The V-1 was Hitler's vengeance weapon. It was the direct forefather of the cruise missiles that can fly down a street in downtown Baghdad. The V-1 carried enough high explosive to destroy a large building or a pursuing fighter. You couldn't shoot them down from behind because uh, the, the fuel tanks and the bomb would explode and there'd be a lot of splinters and you didn't want to pick up a lot of debris because you would knock out an engine so we had to shoot them down from an angle, in other words, use deflection shooting. The German technical threat was not over yet. In September 1944, a mysterious explosion destroyed a building in London. At first, they thought it was a gas line rupture. In fact, it was the first long-range ballistic missile, the V-2. 4,000 were launched against the Allies. Even those numbers were too few to change the course of the war. The Allied bombing continued around the clock as their armies were closing in on Germany from the east and the west. The war of technology and tactics was rapidly coming to its final conclusion. The odds heavily favored the attackers who could now produce air crew and aircraft faster than the Germans could shoot them down. In a last desperate attempt, 200,000 schoolboys were called up to man the flak batteries. There was a fire from a thousand cannons, and there were nearly a thousand bombers, 
and it was a noise of flak as uh, as fine and the, and the, the flak splinters uh, produced uh, sparks on on the ground and uh, the uh, incendiary bombs uh, hang uh, mm. partly in, in the trees and on the roofs and even on the uh, roof of the flak bunker one cannot imagine what it was and it was a, a noise of hell uh, but i cannot describe it between 39 and 45 bomber command had probably 125,000 or so air crew fly at least one operational sortie of that number just over 47,000 were killed, another 10,000 became prisoners of war, and seven or 8,000 more, if I remember correctly, were killed in flying training accidents. So that the total casualty rate is well above 50%. You had less than a half, half uh, uh, one in two chance of surviving an operational tour uh, in Bomber Command. Peter Spoden's first kill was a Lancaster over Pinamunde. Many years after the war, he was asked about it. Martin Middlebrook came into my house and he was writing several books and he asked me about Peenemünde. <coughs> and uh, he gave me then a list of uh, the crew. That time I was flying for an airline as a pilot. I was married, I had four boys in the age of 20, 22. Nice, fine fellows. I love very much. And he gave me the list of the crew I had shot down. Flight officer, 23 years old. Navigator, 21. Gunner, 18. Up, uh, upward gunner, 19. Heaven's sake, I said, uh, these boys were in the age like my sons now. I tell you, I was deeply shocked. This was hurting me. What had I done? How would I feel if my sons would be killed now in a war? Terrible. And uh, I can feel how the parents must have felt when they were informed about the death of their sons or the missing sons. At the end of the war, the veterans buried their dead. They came home and put the war behind them. They went back to work and built the country we know today. They left a legacy of freedom and prosperity paid in full. We may never see their kind again. Hope there's never another war like it. I think once. The war is over, let's, let's let it lay. No more wars. <laughs>